will come to order. I welcome Ranking Member Lankford, members of the committee, and our witnesses. Today, we are examining the Department of Homeland Security's process for managing migrant arrivals at the southwest border and how this process has changed after Title 42 ended. From March 2020 to May 2023, DHS used Title 42 public health authorities to quickly expel more than 2.9 million migrants from the United States. When the Title 42 authorities ended on May 11, 2023, DHS started processing all migrants arriving at the southwest border under regular immigration authorities. This process is complex, and things like demographics and expression of fear all influence how a migrant is processed. And because the border is so dynamic, DHS's programs and protocols change frequently. Each of the components represented here today, Border Patrol, the Office of Field Operations, Enforcement and Removal Operations, and Citizenship and Immigration Services play pivotal roles in this complex process. Border Patrol and OFO are on the front lines and are responsible for apprehension and initial processing along the southwest border. ERO is responsible for tracking migrants during the pendency of their removal proceedings, including through detention and alternatives to detention programs. And USCIS manages credible fear interviews and asylum applications. Any bottleneck or delay at any point in this process can have serious impacts on our border management system. Delays can cause overcrowding at CBP facilities, which can lead to unsheltered releases, also known as street releases in border communities. The Tucson sector is currently one of the busiest sectors in the country for migrant encounters, and the border communities in this sector are at high risk for street releases. As this subcommittee has explored in previous hearings, street releases cause serious harm to migrants and border communities. Congress needs to understand this process in order to modernize our border management system and keep Arizona families safe and secure. My border and immigration proposal with Senator Tom Tillis includes several important improvements to this process to ensure our border is secure and that migrants are treated fairly and humanely. Today's hearing gives us an opportunity to learn how this process has changed since the end of Title 42 and how these changes affect our border management system. I hope the information we gather today will motivate others to join us in advocating for common sense solutions to our broken border policies. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. And now I'd like to recognize Ranking Member Lankford for his opening statement. Senator Sinema, thank you. Thank you for holding this hearing. To our witnesses, thank you, uh, not only for being here today, uh, all your preparation for today, uh, your uh, written statements that are in, your oral statements that are coming, but thanks for your service to the country. Uh, it's incredibly important. Everywhere I travel in Oklahoma, uh, I have someone that stops me and asks me, whether it's urban or rural, how's it going on the border, what's happening with the system? People are concerned. There are six million people that have been encountering coming across our border uh, just in the last two and a half years, and people are exceptionally concerned about that. And they want to know what's happening and where things are going. Uh, this subcommittee has had several hearings uh, dealing with immigration. We've dealt with uh, GSA's management of the ports. Uh, we've dealt with social media and some of the illegal, illicit activities that are happening uh, to recruit individuals coming across the border. This one in particular, I'm pretty excited about, actually. We've not had the opportunity to be able to sit down and talk about where is the process. Since the end of Title 42, there have been a lot of promises that have been made, uh, but we really don't understand the full breadth of the process and what actually happens to each individual as they come across the border. Uh, we know bits and pieces of it, um, but some of the terms are new, and some of the terms, quite frankly, there's been a lot of working out on. The term rebuttable presumption uh, is a new term uh, that's actually out there that everyone's trying to figure out how does this actually work. Uh, there were promises that uh, there would be a, a dramatic drop in the number of individuals crossing our border illegally. There were for about six weeks or so. Uh, then as just was reported by the Washington Post, we had the highest numbers of family crossings in the history of the country in August. Uh, so the numbers have shot back up and have shot back up dramatically. Uh, so, and all these questions about what's happening, how it's happening, there will be most of our questions will focus in on what is the process what actually happens if an individual crosses at a port of entry they're treated one way between a port of entry they're treated a different way if at a port of entry and they've done cbp1 app uh, they're treated different than a person who just shows up with that one there's now parole there's also what's happening in separate with rebuttable presumptions there's a lot of confusion on the process and at the tail end of that cartels are using that confusion to be able to push additional people coming across the border 
we've got to be able to know what is happening, what is the process for each of those individuals, and what actually happens in a court setting in the days ahead for these individuals. So today's hearing will have the opportunity to be able to walk through all of those different uh, scenarios and to be able to determine where do things go. A recent report from the USCIS uh, Osbudsman um, highlighted some of the backlog issues and to be able to raise some questions about how these individuals can be vetted. Uh, there's been different numbers that have come out uh, of late to be able to talk about the quantity of individuals and how many we can track and how many we can't track, those that are actually detained and those that are on the non-detained docket and what happens to those individuals. So I appreciate everyone coming, everyone coming prepared because we have a lot to be able to talk through today and we'll try to get to as many practical things as we possibly can as we walk through this. So I appreciate the input from every one of you and look forward to all your questions, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and promise you, I'm gonna flood you with questions for the record as well uh, to be able to follow up on it and to be able to gather data as well. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Senator Cinema. Oh, thank you, Ranking Member Langford. It is the practice of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you would all please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. We will now hear from our witnesses. I'll ask each of our witnesses to keep their remarks to seven minutes or less, and your full written statements will be entered into the hearing record. Um, I'd like to first introduce our first two witnesses representing Customs and Border Protection components, Chief David B. Miller and Math Mr. Matthew Davies, who will be jointly delivering CBP's testimony. Chief B. Miller currently serves as the Chief of Law Enforcement Operations for the U.S. Border Patrol in Washington, D.C. He's responsible for the oversight of day-to-day -day Border Patrol operations throughout the United States and in international engagements. He serves as the principal advisor to the chief of the Border Patrol on enforcement operations, personnel, infrastructure, and technology requirements. Mr. Davies serves as the executive director for admissibility and passenger programs within the Office of Field Operations, or FO. In this role, he oversees multiple national level programs related to admissibility enforcement and traveler facilitation, in addition to serving as a primary point of contact for engagement between the travel industry and the Office of Field Operations. Welcome, gentlemen. You are recognized for seven minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Sinema, Ranking Member Lankford, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It is an honor to testify today and discuss U.S. Customs and Border Protection's operations at our nation's ports of entry since the termination of the Title 42 Public Health Order. I am proud to represent the more than 30,000 dedicated personnel of CBP's Office of Field Operations, commonly referred to as OFO, who remained on the front line through, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and who worked tirelessly every day across 328 ports of entry to protect our border, our homeland, and our communities. OFO must balance multiple complex mission sets, including the processing of inadmissible persons, facilitating lawful trade and travel critical to our nation's economy, and protecting our communities from dangerous activities of transnational criminal organizations. Today, I will summarize OFO's current operations for processing inadmissible persons and highlight our ongoing enforcement and facilitation efforts. OFO's current processing procedures for inadmissible persons at Southwest border ports of entry developed from an approach that the Department of Homeland Security began implementing last year to manage the continued increase in irregular migration and for OFO to ensure performance of our primary security and facilitation mission objectives. Starting in October of 2022, DH implemented a, DHS implemented a process allowing certain Venezuelan nationals to travel to the United States by air to seek parole, which is granted on a case-by-case -case basis for up to two years. This process was expanded in January for nationals of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Haiti, along with a CBP-1 application featuring feature enabling applicants to request advanced travel authorization via the app. To receive advanced travel authorization, these nationals must meet specified criteria to include having a U.S.-based financial sponsor and clearing CBP's rigorous biometric and biographic screening. As of July 31st, more than 181,000 Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans have arrived through this process. Building on this approach, on May 11th, when the Title 42 order ended and CBP resumed applying its full range of immigration authorities under Title 8, DHS and the Department of Justice implemented a circumvention of lawful pathways rule, establishing parameters and processes for asylum eligibility. The rule was implemented in conjunction with a new CBP-1 feature that allows non-citizens seeking to enter the United States to submit advanced biographic and biometric information and schedule an appointment with a CBP officer at one of eight designated ports of entry 
for appropriate processing disposition under Title VIII as determined on a case-by-case -case basis considering the totality of circumstances. The CBP-1 app is just one example of how OFO is using innovative technologies to enhance the security and efficiency of processes at our ports of entry. OFO also continues to expand electronic A-file functionality across our operational footprint. This initiative allows CBP, ICE, and USCIS to share and maintain a single immigration case file in a digital environment, replacing a paper-based process. Prior to May 11th, OFO implemented electronic A-file processing for notice to appear and certain other Title VIII dispositions throughout the Southwest Border Field Offices, including at the eight ports of entry that inspect non-citizens with CBP-1 appointments. In August, 80% of the amenable inadmissible population encountered by OFO at the Southwest border was processed using an electronic A-file. The transition to integrated digital processing platforms as part of comprehensive border management operations enables OFO to create significant efficiencies for our officers, modernize our processes, manage our available operational resources, and pursue other mission priorities. While OFO continues to address irregular migration challenges, we also maintain a persistent focus on national and economic security. For example, we continue to combat the increasing threat of illicit synthetic drugs, especially fentanyl, being trafficked into the United States. To date this fiscal year, CBP has seized approximately 24,000 pounds of fentanyl nationwide, with most of it, 21,000 pounds, seized at our ports of entry. CBP is pursuing several strategic objectives to address this significant issue, including expanded partnerships and information management to deliver actionable intelligence, advancement of data integration and analytics to enhance targeting efforts, and focused law enforcement actions to disrupt and dismantle illicit synthetic drug networks. At the same time, OFO is facilitating growing volumes of international travel across all operational environments. In July, the number of travelers arriving by air into the United States increased approximately 18% when compared to the same time last year, while pedestrian and passenger vehicle traffic at our land border ports of entry increased by 12 and 11 percent, respectively. We also continue to facilitate the flow of trillions of dollars in legitimate cargo every year through our ports of entry, while enforcing hundreds of trade laws that protect American businesses and consumers. As part of our planning for the end of Title 42, OFO surged resources, technology, and personnel to safely and efficiently manage challenges at the ports of entry while maintaining a persistent focus on our other missions, including but not limited to interdicting illicit drugs and facilitating the flow of legitimate trade and travel to ensure continued national and economic security. I appreciate the subcommittee's continued support of our mission and our workforce, and I look forward to your questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, Chairwoman Cinema, Ranking Member Langford and distinguished members of the I'm not, subcommittee. I'm not sure that microphone is working. Yeah, oh, there it is. Up. Okay, thanks. It is an honor to testify today on behalf of the U.S. Border Patrol to discuss the operations along the southwest border, which uh, since the termination of Title 42 public health order. This past May, the U.S. Border Patrol celebrated its 99th anniversary as we approach 100 years to this country, much has changed in the agency and throughout the world. However, during my 25 years of service with the U.S. Border Patrol, at least two aspects have remained unchanged. First, the Border Patrol mission has always been complex, demanding, and very dangerous. Second, the ability of our workforce to persevere even during the most challenging times it is truly remarkable and a reflection of the agent's can-do attitude. There are three areas that I would like to focus on today. First, summarizing the Border Patrol's current immigration enforcement processes. Second, discuss our ongoing border security operations and initiatives. And third, highlight how we are addressing anticipated operational challenges. First, our immigration enforcement processes. While Title 42 was in place, it was part of a national effort to prevent the spread of COVID-19. During that time, the Border Patrol expelled certain migrants encountered between the ports of entry. While this aided in the streamlining, the return of certain individuals, it also led to a higher level of repeat encounters. Since Title 42 ended, all migrants interdicted between the ports of entry are transported to Border Patrol facilities processed in accordance with Title VIII authorities 
and appropriate consequences are applied. This may include expedited removal and transfer to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. As part of our processing and intake procedures, the Border Patrol is committed to ensuring the health and safety of those in our custody, including providing on-site medical care and referrals to local medical services when necessary. The Border Patrol faces its, each Border Patrol sector faces its own unique challenge. Regardless of the circumstance or environment in which encounters occur, agents will continue to adapt to the ever-changing threats. Which brings me to my second point, ongoing security operations and initiatives. In addition to our immigration enforcement duties, the Border Patrol maintains a persistent focus on our mission objectives aimed at countering sophist sophisticated and ruthless transnational criminal organizations, or TCOs. When it comes to combating drug trafficking, such as the deadly flow of fentanyl, Border Patrol has amplified its efforts to target and seize illicit drugs between the ports of entry. Recently, during a two-month intelligence-driven operation, the Border Patrol seized nearly 2,500 pounds of fentanyl, along with thousands of other pounds of dangerous narcotics and weapons. These efforts are in direct, uh, these efforts are directed to protect the citizens and the communities of the United States. Additionally, Coordination with our international partners inform uh, information sharing on migration flows and drug trafficking activities. This increases our domain awareness and influences how the Border Patrol plans and leverages its resources. The Border Patrol also collaborates with our many local, state, and federal law enforcement partners to counter illicit activities of TCOs that prey on vulnerable, vulnerable migrants. All too often, smugglers abandon them in dangerous and life-threatening situations. To that end, the Border Patrol agents regularly conduct rescues and provide emergency medical care to those in distress. Our agents rescued over 37,000 migrants this fiscal year, including nearly 3,000 in August alone. This brings me to my third and final point. As we reflect on the past 99 years of the Border Patrol's history, and, and as we rise to the current operational demands, there are several complexities and challenges that I must address as we look forward. We must continue to invest in our workforce, provide them with the tools to face these extraordinary challenges head on. We also can't overlook the importance of our critical infrastructure and the significant role our facilities play in our law enforcement mission. While quick solutions are unlikely, our facilities, including our checkpoints, must be modernized to face the evolving threats without impacting trade and travel. And lastly, the most significant operational challenge facing the Border Patrol is that our agency is increasingly performing detention and processing related duties that are outside the scope of Border Patrol's frontline mission. While we should be focusing our efforts to combat the flow of illicit drugs and disruption of TCOs, much of the agent's time is spent transporting, processing, and detaining migrants. This substantially increases the risk of gotaway traffic, including narcotics, terrorists, and other contraband. Border security is national security. In closing, the U.S. Border Patrol will not waver from our critical mission. And will, and will continue to serve and protect the nation with honor. I am grateful for the continued support of Congress and appreciate the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Our next witness is Mr. Daniel Bible. Mr. Bible is the Deputy Executive, Executive Associate Director for the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Removal Operations, um, also known as ERO. Mr. Bible leads ERO in its mission to protect the homeland through the arrest and removal of non-citizens who undermine the safety of our communities and the integrity of our immigration laws. Responsible for a budget of approximately $4.4 billion, Mr. Bible directs operations of more than 8,600 employees assigned to 25 ERO field offices and headquarters in more than 200 domestic locations and 25 overseas locations. Welcome, Mr. Bible. You are recognized for seven minutes. 
Chairwoman Cinema, Ranking Member Langford, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your continued support for the dedicated and hardworking women and men of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Enforcement and Removal Operations. I am proud to serve beside them, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to appear before you today. ERO's mission is to protect the homeland through the arrest and removal of non-citizens who undermine <clears throat> the safety of U.S. communities and the integrity of the immigration system. While ERO, ERO primarily focuses law enforcement activities within the interior of the United States, border enforcement efforts during recent years have stretched ERO's resources. As a result, ERO must carefully balance its resources to continue to uphold its mission in the face of changing operational conditions and new demands, including significant shifts in the post-Title 42 environment. During implementation of the Title 42 Public Health Order, ERO, ERO worked closely with U.S. Customs and Border Protection to support enforcement operations at the southwest border. As CBP conducted Title 42 expulsions at the border, ERO conducted Title 42 expulsion flights while continuing to remove amenable non-citizens under Title 8 Immigration Authority. From March 2020 until May 11, 2023, ICE assisted in more than 184,000 Title 42 expulsions. ERO, ERO also provided direct and sustained support for DHS efforts to decompress border facilities. In FY22, approximately 1,000 ERO employees were detailed to the southwest border to process cases and offer transportation for non-citizens apprehended by CBP to alternate, uh, alternative to detention locations, ICE facilities, uh, and uh, um, as appropriate. ICE's bed space inventory is being constrained by the increase of detention facility closures, pending litigation and court decisions, and state laws that hinder the use of contract facilities. However, ICE has taken several steps to align its detention um, capacity with operational needs in the post-Title 42 environment, including increasing um, resources to release non-citizens with positive credible fear determinations in a safe, humane, and timely manner, leveraging alternatives to detention, and focusing detention resources on non-citizens who are subject to mandatory detention, pose risks to public safety or national security, and maybe flight risks. In the post-Title 42 environment, DHS has increased use of expedited removal under its Title VIII authority. Once apprehended by CBP at the border, or arrested by ICE in the interior of the United States, non-citizens subject to expedited removal may be, may be detained by ICE. If non-citizens subject to expedited removal indicate that the intent to seek asylum or claim fear, they are afforded a credible fear interview with USCIS officers while in ICE custody. If US, USCIS determines the non-citizens has failed to establish a credible fear, ICE continues to prepare for expedited removal. If USCIS determines that the credible fear has been established, the non-citizens are generally released from ICE custody. Nevertheless, by expediting the review of asylum claims of non-citizens and expedited removal proceedings, no matter if positive credible fear findings exist or not, DHS is able to provide relief more quickly to those non-citizens who are eligible and to more quickly remove those non-citizens who are not. Over the past fiscal year, ICE began to operate several programs geared toward the fair, humane, and expedited processing, processing of family units. In May 2023, ICE announced the implementation of the Family Expedited Removal Management Initiative, referred to as FIRM, for family units apprehended at the southwest border who are processed for expedited removal and have expressed a fear of persecution or torture. Through FIRM, certain family unit heads of households are placed on alternatives to detention and are closely supervised while the family awaits a credible fear interview. By the end of the month, FIRM will be operational in 40 cities nationwide. Over the past 18 months, ERO has also increased its removal flight capacity. The number of international charter flights conducted by ICE Air operations has increased more than twofold in the latter half of FY23 compared to the first half of the fiscal year. Removals via commercial airlines have also increased in the post-Title 42 environment. As of August 12, 2023, ICE has completed 4,282 commercial removals, an 85% increase from the same um, period in FY22. ERO remains committed to protecting the United States through the arrest and removal of those non-citizens who undermine the safety of U.S. communities and the integrity of U.S. immigration laws. In preparation for the termination of Title 42 and changes in migration trends, ERO took, 
um, several steps to ensure the agency would continue managing all aspects of the immigration enforcement process, including providing CBP with logistical support at the southwest border, increasing the agency's transportation ca capacities, developing and operating several family-focused programs geared towards the fair, humane, and exp expedited processing of family, family units, increasing the use of expedited removal under ICE's Title VIII authority, and reinstituting the civil immigration enforcement priorities. ERO's efforts to allow agencies to ensure fair and humane immigration systems while fulfilling its critical national security and public safety mission as well. Thank you again for inviting me to testify today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Our final witness is Mr. Andrew Davidson. Mr. Davidson is the Acting Deputy Director for the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. In his permanent role, he serves as a Senior Counselor for Humanitarian Programs in the Office of the Director. Previously, Mr. Davidson served as the Acting Deputy Associate Director of the Refugee Asylum and International Operations Directorate and is the Chief of the Asylum Division of the Directorate. Welcome, Mr. Davidson. You are, re you are recognized for seven minutes. Chair Sinema, Ranking Members Langford, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today, today together with my colleagues from U.S. Customs and Border Protection and U.S. Cus US and Immigration Customs Enforcement to discuss how the Department of Homeland Security processes non-citizen counters at the southwest border. My name is Andrew Davidson, and I'm the Acting Deputy Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. My testimony today will describe the role of USCIS at the southwest border, and particularly how USCIS processes non-citizens in CBP and ICE custody, and has operationalized the circumvention of lawful pathways rule. USCIS administers the nation's lawful immigration system, including the adjudication of affirmative asylum claims and applications for refugee status. USCIS employees work shoulder to shoulder with their ICE and CB colleagues from conducting protection screening interviews at DHS facilities to coordinating on national security and public safety issues. USCIS has a proud history of providing immigration benefits to eligible ind individuals from all over the world. These benefits support the fundamental values and needs of our nation, be the economic, humanitarian, and otherwise in the public interest. USCIS delivers these benefits while ever being vigilant for those who seek to undermine the integrity of our immigration system, or worse, those who seek to do us harm. USCIS is only able to accomplish this complex and vital mission through the efforts of its thousands of dedicated public servants who each day administer a complex immigration system fairly and professionally. For more than a decade, the steadily rising influx of migrants across the southwest border has resulted in significant increases in apprehensions and the numbers of non-citizens placed into expedited removal. USCIS screens individuals for credible fear in some situations as part of the expedited removal process and plays an important role in ensuring that potential asylees or victims of torture are not improperly returned to their home countries in contravention of our laws, while those who are found um, ineligible or expeditiously removed. Our specially trained asylum officers conduct screening interviews for non-citizens who express a fear of return or otherwise express a fear of persecution or torture or indicate intention to apply for asylum during the expedited removal process. The screening interview is conducted to determine whether the non-citizen has a credible fear of persecution or torture. Non-citizens who meet the credible fear threshold may be retained by USCIS for an asylum merits interview to adjudicate the asylum application or may be placed in removal proceedings in immigration court where they can apply for asylum or other relief or protection. Individuals found not to have a credible fear of persecution or torture may request a review of the finding by an immigration judge. Over the last 10 years, as irregular migration to the southwest border has increased, the number of credible fear refers, referrals to USCIS has sharply increased as well. Approximately 35,000 detained credible fear cases were referred to USCIS in fiscal year 2013. USCIS has seen that number more than triple to approximately 107,000 so far in fiscal year 2023 as of August 11th. About 51,000 of these cases have been received since May 12, 2023 after the expiration of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Title 42 Public Health Order and the return to processing of all non-citizens under long-standing Title VIII immigration authorities. USCIS has pursued a number of strategic strategies to, pursue, to address the increased caseload, including significantly expanding authorized asylum officer positions, deploying employees who had been previously protection trained from across USCIS to assist in the credible fears caseload, 
and maintaining remote interview capabilities. Our ability to process credible fear cases timely saves valuable DHS attention resources and enables the entire expedited removal process to operate more efficiently. USCIS remains strongly committed to supporting the government-wide response to the migration flows on the southwest border, including ensuring those who seek protection are provided the opportunity to have those protection claims heard. At the same time, USCIS remains committed to detecting and deterring immigration fraud, including within the asylum and humanitarian benefits. The Fraud Detection and National Security Directorate within USCIS has embedded teams at each of the 11 asylum offices. These local teams conduct pre-interview screening, provide on-site consultation to asylum officers interviewing applicants, analyze trends in large-scale fraud schemes, and serve as local liaisons to interagency law enforcement partners. USCIS, USCIS continues to lead an asylum fraud working group within the interagency, and in recent years, USCIS has supported multiple successful criminal prosecutions and convictions involving asylum fraud, further demonstrating the department's commitment to ensuring the overall integrity of the immigration system. Over the last few months, DHS has implemented new measures of humanely managing the southwest border by enforcing our immigration laws while expanding safe, orderly, and lawful immigration pathways. The comprehensive approach is outlined in the DHS Six Pillar Plan. One of the enforcement measures um, implemented is the, uh, is the, ex is the use of expedited removal. To ensure that, ex that ex expedited removal, including the credible fear process, is carried out fairly efficiently and quickly, US USCIS worked with ICE and CBP to digitize part of the credible fear process and reallocated staffing resources so that hundreds of additional personnel were available to process credible fear interviews. Additionally, certain non-citizen populations are now processed for exploited removal while they are in CBP and ICE facilities within days or weeks after they're encountered. Through these measures, DHS provides relief more quickly to those who are eligible and removes those who are not. On May 11, 2023, the Circumvention of Lawful Pathways rule took effect. This rule encourages migrants to use lawful, safe, and orderly pathways to enter the United States and imposes a rebuttal presumption of ineligibility for asylum for certain non-citizens who fail to do so. The CLP rule provides exemptions for non-citizens from the presumption of asylum ineligibility and allows non-citizens to rebut the presumption of asylum ineligibility by demonstrating exceptionally compelling circumstances. When a non-citizen attends their credible fear interview with USCIS, an asylum officer will assess whether the non-citizen is subject to the CLP rule, and if so, whether an exception applies or the presumption of ineligibility can be rebutted. USCIS will continue to respond to its rising numbers of credible fear referrals by ensuring DHS follows the laws written by Congress. Swiftly processing non-citizens so they may either seek relief before an immigration judge or be expeditiously removed. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. We'll now begin the question part of the hearing. Each member of the committee will have seven minutes, and I recognize myself for seven minutes. Um, my first question is for Chief B. Miller. Now that Title 42 has ended, Border Patrol is back to regular processing. Can you walk us through what happens after a migrant has been apprehended and what elements are covered in the initial processing? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so from the time of apprehension, uh, the, the group is uh, identified to be in a, uh, a variety of different categories. One, a s of single adults, two, of unaccompanied children, and three, family units. And their um, initial intake from the field uh, is identified and then they're taken to the appropriate locations to be processed. Once at, they're at the facilities, they receive an initial intake uh, medical screening and if they require additional medical attention, they are referred to um, a local local hospital for further care. Um, their their um, materials and, uh, and uh, items that they have with them are, are inventoried and uh, put into safe keep keeping until they're transferred out of the facility. Then they uh, enter the processing portion where they're screened and records are checked. And then a determination is what is, of what is going to, uh, what their path, immigration pathway will be from there. They're asked um, if, they, uh, if they claim fear. Um, if they do, they'll, they'll go through the, uh, one of the uh, credible fear screening processes and uh, turned over to ERO for further you, uh, um, uh, for further uh, review, um, and then anybody uh, that withdraws 
will be returned uh, back to one of the con contiguous nations that, uh, that we have, uh, uh, Mexico or Canada. Thank you. Uh, my second question is for Mr. Davies. While OFO was operating under Title 42 authorities from March of 2020 to May 11th of 2023, very few migrants were processed at ports of entry. Now, ports across the southwest border process over 1,500 migrants a day. Most of the migrants processed at ports of entry make an appointment on the CBP-1 app, while others wait in line for the chance to be accepted for a walk-in appointment. Does the advanced information received through the app help speed up processing time? Uh, what is the average amount of time it takes to process a migrant who schedules an appointment through the CBP-1 appointment app compared to the average amount of time it takes to process a migrant who gets a walk-in appointment? Uh, thank you for the question. So as you pointed out, CBP-1 is used as a scheduling tool. Uh, we do intake uh, from the international boundary line a, a variety of different um, individuals. You know, for OFO, it's legitimate travel in addition to the migrants. And so the use of CBP-1 with an appointment helps us to identify individuals at that limit line who um, are scheduled and ready to be processed. Uh, the process itself varies at, at some of our ports. Uh, in, in some, the uh, CBP-1 appointments are sent to our primary inspection location where the, the use of CBP-1 actually helps to uh, pre-populate some of the data that has been submitted as part of the app uh, in the primary inspection, and from there they're referred into secondary uh, in, in other ports of entry, we have established a process where they are directly put to secondary um, from the, the limit line. And so the, the benefits of using CBP-1 in terms of time savings and pre-population of data are, are fairly minimal uh, in, in the second circumstance where we really see the savings on our time is the use of the electronic A-file where on average we're saving up to 30 minutes per case by using the electronic A-file. The total average processing time is about four hours for us to process a, a notice to appear case. Uh, if there are different case dispositions, they might take uh, slightly different amounts of time. Thank you, and to follow up, to what extent does OFO coordinate with local NGOs to prioritize walk-in appointments for vulnerable migrants? Yeah, we have the ability to coordinate locally with, with NGOs and, and with, with governments, as, as uh, was pointed out earlier, especially when we talk about uh, releases of individuals into the communities. Uh, we have that ability. We prefer to recognize individuals who have been uh, registered with the CBP-1. And what we really focus on are the individuals that are uh, clear to us to be vulnerable. So we focus on urgent humanitarian concerns, medical, urgent medical emergencies um, to prioritize uh, in addition to those individuals who uh, are, are clearly recognizable as unaccompanied children to bring in from the limit line for processing and prioritization. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bible, um, given the limited number of ERO detention beds, most migrants are released on ATD rather than held in detention. However, migrants with known criminal records or affiliations are generally detained. Could you describe the process between ERO and other federal agencies to determine whether a migrant should be held in detention or released? Thank you for the question. Um, typically, all of our detention cases are, are, are people referred to detention are, are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we look at risk of flight, um, potential for being a public safety threat or national security th threat. We also look at mitigating factors of, of you know, long, our longevity of time within the U United States, advanced age, um, medical conditions that might, might militate towards releasing an individual on ATD rather than keeping them in detention. Primarily, we look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis and look for those public safety and national security threats. To follow up on that, what happens when there are no open beds and ICE must decide how to handle a situation with a migrant who has a known criminal history? If the criminal history rises to the level of being a public safety threat, um, I haven't seen in my, my 25 years where we couldn't find a, a bed for an individual um, that has that kind of criminality. We'll make room. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davidson, in certain Border Patrol sectors, including the U.S. sector, USCIS is conducting credible fear interviews inside Border Patrol facilities. As a result, migrants are ending up staying in Border Patrol custody longer to await those interviews. On average, how long do migrants wait for USCIS to conduct a credible fear interview in Border Patrol custody after a migrant has expressed fear? And how does this compare to the average wait time for migrants who are released on the alternative to detention programs. 
Thank you, Senator. It's two days from referral to interview and an additional two days from the interview to service of the decision. So it's four days overall in CBP custody, which is a record time for USCIS. The second question would um, be related to our firm program. Um, and then through the firm, which is for family, for families, and they're referred to us um, between six to 12 days after um, CBP sends them to the destination cities. And so that's the only comparison I have through the firm process. Um, but certainly what um, we are processing, prioritizing, and, and CBP custody, it's record times in terms of us being able to turn around our decisions. It's four days on average. Thank you. I now recognize um, Ranking Member Langford for his questions. Thank you. Again, I appreciate all of you. This group are not the policy makers. We understand that. You're the ones that are actually carrying the policy out. And so we appreciate the help of knowing uh, what's actually happening on the ground, what's the process on this. The concern that I have, as well as a lot of other folks have, is if I take the previous 12 years, both terms of the Obama administration, all four years of the Trump administration, the number of people that illegally crossed the border during that previous 12 years equals the number of people that have illegally crossed the border in less than three years under the Biden administration. So when people feel this is structurally different, it's structurally different. There's something that's really changing that's happened on a policy, that's happening in movement of people. Now, this is not me laying blame on all of you. We're trying to figure out the now what? How do we actually figure out the process and what actually happens from here? I do know there's some folks from DHS that are probably watching and monitoring this. Thank you very much for doing that, by the way, and for the engagement and for all of you actually being here. But I would bring up a couple of things just to the DHS folks that are actually tracking all this hearing as well. We've made some very specific requests of them of numbers in the past to be able to turn those over. We're yet to get those in a timely manner. Uh, Senator Sima and I have made a request for special interest alien briefing to be able to get details on that. We've yet to be able to get that briefing. Uh, Senator. Uh, Murphy and I have asked for additional information about the notice to appear delegation of authority that we've asked about. We've yet to be able to get that. And we've asked for a specific briefing on circumvention of lawful pathways to just spend more time with that because that's entirely new as a process. We've yet to get that. So again, none of you are responsible for that, but I do wanna be able to put out, this has been an ongoing frustration that we've literally seen as many people cross in less than three years than we have in 12, yet when we ask questions about process that are, how is this working, what's happening, how do we get numbers, we're not getting those. Uh, so that's why I'm really grateful that all of you are here to be able to walk through some of the process and what's actually happening at this point. I do wanna to skip to one of the questions that we have for Senator Cinema and I, and that is on the special interest aliens. For individuals that are crossing the border right now, and it's by the thousands from Mauritania, what criminal history, background information, data do we have on those individuals from Mauritania coming into the country? Do we have any background information on those individuals? Do we have a cooperative agreement with Mauritania to be able to get background criminal information? Do we have any of that data? I don't know of any. I'm asking y'all if y'all know of any. I'm, I'm seeing the same expression I have. Y'all don't. Do you know of any criminal history that we're getting on these individuals from Mauritania? No. No, I don't, I don't know of any either on that. Currently this year so far, just through earlier this year, we've had 10,000 individuals that had come from Mauritania. The vast majority of those, my understanding is, are released somewhere in the country and we don't know hardly anything about those individuals. Uh, we also have a pretty dramatic increase, about 63% increase of Syrians that are coming in the country. Uh, we've had almost 15,000 people from China uh, that have come across the border that understand we don't have a criminal history exchange with China. With Pakistan, we have 1,000 folks. We have over 2,000 folks from Somalia uh, that have come. These special interest aliens, we're trying to figure out the details on them, and as far as we can tell, they're being processed and released in the country awaiting a hearing in the future, and we don't have a day-to-day -day supervision of those individuals. Is that accurate or not accurate? Mr. Bible. It, 
it's accurate that we're we're not tracking them on a day-to-day -day basis, not not the totality of them. Some are probably on alternatives to detention where we have a more 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 tracking on. So for those individuals that are on alternatives to detention, how long are they on the alternatives to detention program for? Is that months, days? Is that all the way up until they're hearing? How long are we tracking those individuals? Well, we escalate and de-escalate um, depending on several factors, um, criminality, um, compliance with the ATD program, and, 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 and other factors. Our average length of stay on alternative detention is approximately 547 days. Okay. Is that 547 days until their hearing time, or what is that trigger at that point? It, it depends on... It depends on, again, the compliance rate and, and community ties. What, uh, we can de-escalate de them off the alternatives detention program if, if those conditions are met. But we can also scale it up if they are not complying with the conditions of the release. It's our understanding the vast majority of individuals that are on alternatives to detention, it's three or four months or less that they're on an alternatives to detention program. Is that accurate or not accurate? You're saying it's a year and a half, basically, that they're on. I mean, we did have an increase of um, individuals put on alternatives to detention as they were leaving um, the southwest border until they reached their um, their their um, destination city where they were de-enrolled, but um, where they actually checked in, and we were starting to monitor on, on the non-detained docket. Right. Well, the, the last numbers that we had in that came in from DHS was tracking about 130 days uh, that people were on alternative to detention, and after that they're not. And they're significantly longer than that before they're actually hearing date. If they're doing an asylum request, um, it's our understanding that if they're requesting, for instance, New York, uh, the next open dates are somewhere in 2033 uh, for that hearing time. So we've got a pretty big gap of individuals that have claimed credible fear, have gone through the initial screening, have an alternative to detention uh, for, let's say, a year and a half uh, for the max on that. Most likely, more like 130 days was the last numbers that we had, and then the next eight years, uh, if they're awaiting that hearing time uh, in um, New York, it's shorter in other areas, uh, but in New York and Florida and multiple areas, uh, it could be seven, eight, nine, ten years before they get to the hearing. Is that accurate or not accurate? Right now, we are scheduled out um, approximately ten years, at least in New York City. However, we are um, working on technological solutions to where we can where a non-citizen can <clears throat> update their address on, on our website, request mail out NTA, which will allow us to spread out the workload throughout the country and, um, and throughout our workforce where we, didn't, where we won't have to just rely on check-ins um, directly into the New York City office, which doesn't have a physical plan to handle that, that volume. What I'd like to do is I'm gonna come back for a second round of questions here in a little bit once everybody's gone through, and I wanna walk through the process. And what I wanna talk through is the difference between an individual at a port of entry that has a CBB1 app uh, time scheduled, somebody that doesn't have that, somebody that comes between ports of entry, what actually happens to them in the process, and then once they actually leave the border and they're released in the country, what's actually occurring uh, at that point, I wanna be able to walk through that process and so we can get the differences for that individual uh, because there's pretty serious concerns. Uh, it wasn't that long ago I was at the border and uh, I was at one of the, uh, the times of gathering the muster uh, for Border Patrol and uh, in the muster they were going through standard things and one of the Border Patrol agents asked the question of leadership at that point just at this muster, hey, last night or two nights ago we picked up three guys from Nicaragua in camo in their 20s, looked like they were military, what happened to them? And the response was they were cut loose. We don't have them anymore. And so that kind of dialogue that's happening uh, makes a lot of questions happen in the whole process to try to figure out. But we're trying to figure out how decisions are made when there's three guys in camo, clearly military or military age, and trying to figure out what happens next to them. Obviously, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but everybody's trying to figure out what that actually looks like from there. Senator Blumenthal, you're next for questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, Senator, uh, thank you all for being here, and um, thank you all for your service. Uh, Chief Miller and uh, Executive Director Davies, I was very interested in your testimony about fentanyl and Operation Blue Lotus, which seems to have been successful in increasing fairly drastically the interdiction of fentanyl at the border. As I read the numbers here, um, the, the rate of interdiction is roughly double or more with 4,781 pounds of fentanyl in just two months 
as compared to um, the 14,700 pounds in fiscal year 2022. Um, and you talk here about NIA technology, about the sharing and collaboration on information, um, because the vast majority of fentanyl coming in to this country is at ports of entry, where this technology can be employed. Could you talk a little bit about the potentials for greater use of technology, information sharing, and I know you're in the middle of Operation Artemis right now. Um, in relation to that operation, how these new forms of interdiction can be potentially important. Yeah, th thank you for the question, Senator. And so you're right, Operation Blue Lotus, from our perspective, was a huge success in terms of <laughs> increasing the amount of interdiction of fentanyl that we, we saw over just a short period of time. <clears throat> I think, to your point about non-intrusive inspection technology, we know that we're, we're scanning, uh, or, or I think somewhere around 90% of the interdictions we receive from a narcotics perspective come from uh, non-intrusive inspection scans of a small percentage of the vehicles that are actually crossing our border. We don't, we don't have the existing infrastructure to scan much higher rates. We're appreciative that we have received funding from Congress. We're working on a plan to actually deploy more of our uh, both large-scale and small-scale non-intrusive inspection technologies uh, throughout the southwest border to focus on that. Uh, but as you pointed out, also Operation Artemis now is, is kind of the next level of the fentanyl fight for, for us and really focusing on not just the interdiction of fentanyl itself, but the precursor chemicals, the press, uh, the, the, the pill presses, uh, working with our international partners on uh, sharing that information and, and addressing the, the criminal organizations that are working far beyond our borders to start the, the transshipment and, and movement of fentanyl into the United States. How good is the information sharing with other law enforcement? Uh, with, with other law enforcement in the United States, I think it's very, very good. Uh, we have a very robust process. We're certainly working to increase uh, information sharing across our international partners and our international network. As you would expect, there are uh, some international partners that we have uh, far better uh, information sharing capabilities with than, than others, but we're continually working to improve those. Who are the good and who are the bad? Uh, I, I'd rather not uh, divulge that That's here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I understand fully. Uh, Mr. Davidson, um, how important is counsel, that is some kind of legal advice, in the interviews that are conducted for uh, the, the credible fear interviews that are conducted? It provides due process, Senator, and for the credible fear process, I mean, it's just not an attorney. The, the statute 203.30 allows for, um, for a non-citizen to choose anyone that person wants to consult with, be an attorney or um, a religious um, person or, or anything. But so. my, maybe I wasn't clear in my question. Uh, in your experience, and I open this yeah. question to others as well, a, a person arriving at the border claiming a credible fear, may not speak English, may have no idea what this credible fear thing is, the interview, the standard, uh, no experience with any sort of objective impartial justice system before. Uh, how important is a an advocate uh, in explaining the process to that individual asylum seeker and in implementing the standard to elicit the important facts. It's reasonably important, Senator. I mean, the other, but the caveat to that is certainly that um, my colleagues at CBP and ICE also have an orientation process where they orient an individual seeking asylum to um, the credible fear interview itself through Form M44. I think the, an attorney can help supplement that too as well, and certainly that if an individual wants to seek counsel, then we provide access to counsel and ensure that individual has counsel. And if he so, so, 
desires, and so it's an integral part of the process. Do you think the numbers in your testimony, and I'm not sure um, I understand all of them, but you go through some numbers at the end of your testimony about different percentages. Do you think those percentages would change if more of those asylum seekers had counsel? I think that's a fair point to make. I mean, I, I think that there is certainly um, a tendency to have different outcomes when there's counsel in certain instances, and so not in every instance, but certain instances, yes. I think an individual or a non-citizen who had sought counsel um, for a particular case has, has seen you know, a, a positive like outcome based on their counsel's representation. And the general consensus seems to be that we don't have enough of the counsel, we don't have enough judges, in effect, our justice system, our immigration justice system is lacking resources to fairly and effectively process those asylum seekers. Am I wrong? I, I don't think that's a wrong statement um, as a generality in terms of um, our immigration courts being under-resourced, you know, DHS at this panel being under-resourced, certainly. Um, DHS has painstakingly worked with our advocacy communities to ensure that there are that there are groups that are sponsoring, you know, their attorneys non um, for not you know non bono work certainly, um, and we continue to advocate with our stakeholders to ensure that there is like low cost attorneys provided, um, um, if so if somebody so chooses to do, um, to take that option. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Carper. You're recognized. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I had a chance to, uh, Madam Chairman, to say hello to these uh, gentlemen. Uh, a bit earlier before uh, I went to another meeting, and uh, we're in and out. We were in the voting on the floor. We got other committees and meetings, so I apologize for being uh, not a constant presence in your life for these two hours. A couple of you have, been, have served in the military. Uh, I know anybody ever in the Navy? Yeah, Navy salutes Navy. And uh, good to, uh, to see you. Welcome. Uh, anybody ever served in the Army? Arm yeah, there you go. And uh, I think uh, maybe both of you saw uh, a time uh, overseas. In, as, uh, uh, one who actually uh, spent a lot of time in, 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 in the military and the Navy. I very much value your service. And that role, those roles in uniform, and also these roles in, in uniform. I um, um, have a couple of questions. I hope these have not been answered. I don't think they, they have, but the first one I, I want to, uh, to ask deals with uh, U.S. Border Patrol agents in the field. U.S. Border Patrol agents in the field. And um, I think uh, I... Mr. Uh, B. Miller, people call you B. Miller? The ones that like me. That's, that's a great name. <laughs> but uh, uh, first, uh, again, thanks uh, so much for being here uh, today. And um, uh, the insight you shared with us is, is critical to this com committee. It's valuable to, to me and I think to others as we work to support the Department of Homeland Security and its mission is to maintain a, a safe and a secure Southwest border. I've been privileged to serve, but in the committee, been in the Senate for uh, 22 years. I've been on this committee since it was first founded, created out of the uh, committee on, uh, on uh, uh, de de dealing just with uh, government operations. But so anyway, I have uh, a great uh, affection for the department and the men and women who, who served. Uh, and, and I think it was about two years ago, in 2021, the Department of Homeland Security announced a new position with U.S. Customs, within U.S. Customs and Border uh, Protection, and that is the Border Patrol Processing Coordinators. Border Patrol Processing Coordinators. I don't know if this has already been discussed, but it, it has a, uh, forgive me, but I, I want to drill down on it again, uh, if we could. These coordinators, uh, as I understand it, assist the CBP agents with the care and processing of migrants and allow Border Patrol agents to focus on their law enforcement duties in the field. And uh, Mr. Uh, Chief B. Miller, can you just expand for us, if you will, on the effectiveness and the effectiveness of these new processing coordinators? Present, uh, presently, is there a sufficient number of processing coordinators to allow Border Patrol agents to better uh, resume their duties in the field? Go ahead. Thank you, Senator. You're welcome. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you for the question. Um, I, so absolutely necessary, um, as are um, many of our, our partnerships that we work with. Um, the uh, the uh, Border Patrol Processing Coordinators, we have almost 1,200 of them uh, to date. Um, 
every support we get to return a Border Patrol agent back to the line is, uh, is uh, well received. Um, while we have those 1,200 uh, or 1,200 Border Patrol processing coordinators, we're still far from returning all of our Border Patrol agents back to the line. They are conducting um, duties, as I mentioned in my opening statement, far beyond the scope of their, their uh, responsibilities. We need to get them back to the line. They have an important mission, an important role. All right, thank you. Um, let me follow it up with a question. Uh, uh, again, of you, uh, Chief uh, B. B. Uh, Miller, also uh, uh, Director Davies, if you, uh, if you would. Um, throughout the time he's been in the Senate, I've uh, really focused on root causes in this committee, and, and frankly, uh, in other committees as well. Not just the symptoms or challenges or problems, but what are the root causes? What are we doing about it? What can and should we do about them? But we've seen uh, time and uh, time again that there is a correlation between the rule of law, uh, corruption, and economic opportunity in Central and South American countries and in the migration flows at the U.S. border. Uh, Chief B. Miller and uh, Director uh, Davies, 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 uh, given the, uh, the migration flow in recent years and the number of migrants crossing at different ports of entry along the border, can each of you, can both of you, briefly speak as to how your components respond to these changes? And next, uh, how do you strategically manage resources to ensure that efficiency and efficacy uh, are maintained at various ports of entry? Um, Chief, would you go first and then Director D D Davies? Yes, thank you again for the question. Um, we work with our foreign operation branch and our intelligence branch um, and with uh, Department of Homeland Security um, policy to coordinate with our uh, strategic international partners and monitor the flow through the Western Hemisphere and around the world. This information gives us the opportunity to as I mentioned, leverage our resources and um, deploy them uh, to the optimal locations where we predict the traffic would be coming between the ports of entry. So um, it's an extremely important partnership and uh, it's, it's just beneficial for our mission. Director, Director Davies, please. Yeah, very similar to Chief Bumiller, we, we coordinate with our international partners within the Office of Field Operations. We actually have several programs, um, not just in the Western Hemisphere, but, but across the globe uh, with our immigration advisory program, our joint security program, and our police liaison program that are fo focused on working with our international partners to identify uh, flows, uh, reasons, uh, and, and to come up with solutions to, that can be implemented to uh, limit the ability for people to, to, to move uh, through other countries, you know, f solely for the purpose of exploiting uh, laws while, while maintaining the ability for people who are seeking protection to be able to, to come to the United States lawfully to do so. Last, third and last question, if I could. Uh, in, uh, in your testimony, uh, Chief uh, B. Miller, I'm not picking on you, Chief, but, uh, and Director Davies, uh, but you both ha highlight the, uh, the importance of coordination and collaboration uh, within uh, DHS and other federal uh, partners. Uh, Chief and Director Davies, uh, as we see highs and lows in migration flows uh, along the, our southwestern border, to what extent do each of you receive regular updates on the reasons, primary reasons behind influxes in migration? And how does this information get shared amongst uh, DHS uh, components and help agents do their work on the ground? Director Davies. Yeah, thank you for the question. So we, we do receive regular updates. Um, you know, I would say maybe not quite daily, but certainly every week about the, the flows and some of the reasons. And, and I think really, you know, we share a lot of that information with our officers on the front line. Uh, just to be very candid, the, the reasons don't always make, uh, make a difference in terms of what kind of processing uh, is going to happen or, or you know, it, at the point where they're at the ports of entry uh, or, or in CBP processing, it's, it's too late to affect any change uh, in terms of the reasons that people are leaving. So I know that, you know, at a broader level, we are trying to work with our foreign partners to address some of those root causes, as you said. Uh, we're tracking those reasons, but from an operational perspective, the reasons that people are coming uh, has little impact on what we do operationally. Chief, same question. Same question, same answer, very similar. Um, we do monitor the, uh, some of the push factors, uh, but again, the um, intention of 
migrating uh, to the United States does not have an effect on the way that we respond. Um, regardless of their intentions for coming here, uh, reasons for fleeing their countries, economic or otherwise, um, we still plan uh, our operations based on the movement of, of uh, individuals crossing through uh, the hemisphere. Good. Madam Chair, I'd ask another um, one minute, if I could, just to, to say a closing thought. The, uh, several of us on this committee have been up and, up and down the uh, uh, Central America and Latin America for quite a number of times, quite a, for quite a few years. And there's a reason why they come, uh, want to come up here, and it's because their lives are, in many cases, miserable. One of the things that is making uh, life tough for them is the, uh, the weather, droughts. You know, a lot of folks who used to be able to drive or grow coffee and other uh, commodities, uh, they, they're, they're not able to do that anymore and make a living. The, uh, the other one of the other things that I've noted is we have uh, had to have gone for a lot, too long periods of time, like uh, one Honduras. I remember for a number of years, maybe two or three years, we didn't have any ambassadors, Senate confirmed ambassador in Honduras. Right now, we don't have a Senate confirmed ambassador in Colombia, and we need uh, confirmed Senate confirmed ambassadors in all those countries to help ride herd and make sure that that uh, the folks that are leading those countries are behaving and that we're being a good partner to them. And it's, uh, the, the two points: one. Um, when we have good folks, good candidates have been nominated serving these ambassador positions, we need to seriously take them up and get them done and put them to work. And the second thing is, uh, is drought, so a source of drought. We, I think we have pretty good ideas of what's causing it. it's climate change. We're doing a lot about it. We need to continue to do that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Senator Carper. I now recognize Senator Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chief DeMiller. Uh, you said you have with the U.S. Border Patrol for 25 years? Yes, sir, that's right. So you, you were with the Border Patrol when they used to call it apprehensions then, correct? What you do you, when, when you arrest, encounter, when arrest, you... Arrest, apprehension, yes. Call them apprehensions. Uh, you were also there probably in 2014, that time period when I know DHS Secretary Jay Johnson said a thousand apprehensions a day was a really bad day for Border Patrol. Is that true? Uh, it's true that he said that, yes. I think President Obama actually called that when uh, we, we topped off about 2,000 apprehensions a day. He called that a humanitarian crisis. Uh, you were there. Did you, that kind of feel like a humanitarian crisis back there, 2,000 people apprehended a day? It definitely was a challenge. When, when did we shift from calling app, apprehensions to encounters? So thank you for that question uh, and the opportunity to clarify it. So. The, the difference between an apprehension and an encounter particularly came up during Title 42 uh, because the individuals were not um, uh, formally brought into Border Patrol custody. They were screened and returned immediately. So that's the difference between well, the two. Last time I was at the border, um, yes, there were some screened and returned, and quite a few. I mean, I think over a million, the, the figures I saw. Uh, but an awful lot were processed and dispersed. Last time I was at the border, uh, I was told by Border Patrol agents that their, the goal that was given to them was to encounter, process, and disperse within eight hours. Is that basically the, the goal now? Is that what we're doing? As the chief of law enforcement for Border Patrol, um, that is not the guidance or purpose that we uh, that I direct. So, how long how long are you holding people when you encounter them, before they are processed and dispersed and sent on a plane or a bus to their final destination? What what is the time frame there? Well, that's 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 part of the complexity of the environment that we're operating in right now. So, we uh, we have people, as I mentioned in my opening statement, in our in our custody for far too long. Um, the processing, uh, depending on the uh, um, uh, pathway that, that is uh, appropriate for them. Um, we have a number of, of uh, bottlenecks. Uh, definitely the bottleneck occurs after processing, so waiting do you for know, Do you know the average number of encounters during the Biden administration per day? What the average is? I don't have that number. Really? Oh, uh, the average per day? Yeah. Right now it's about uh, 6,500. 6, yeah, it's about 6,000 a day since the beginning of the Biden administration. 6,000 a day. Again, it was a humanitarian crisis we were apprehending 2,000 a day. It was a bad day, according to Jay Johnson, when 1,000 people were apprehended a day. Now we're averaging for almost the last you know, two and a half years over 6,000 people today. And we cannot get Secretary Mayorkas to say that's a, a, a crisis. Why don't you say it's a problem? He calls it a challenge. 
And I noted in a number of your testimonies, you kept talking about efficiency. You know, just sitting here in this sedate hearing setting, it almost seemed like we've got this under control. This is completely out of control, isn't it? What, what data do, they, do you have, do you keep? Because they don't share it very readily with us in terms of the number of people who have been encountered, processed, dispersed, how many people do we know are known Godaways? What's the estimate of unknown Godaways? Do you have that uh, for the first uh, you know, two and a half years of the Biden administration? Do you have an estimate of that? Because I do. I don't have that broken down right now. Would it surprise you to say about five million people have either been encountered, processed, and dispersed, or are known or unknown Godaways? Five million people. Just put that in perspective, by the way. That, the population of half the states is five million or less. Chief Miller, do you believe that's a crisis? Do you believe that's under control? So not getting too tied up into the semantics of the situation, we are in a situation that is uh, pressing our resources. You talked about most of your Border Patrol agents are spending most of their time in detention and processing, which means we have wide open gaps for known and unknown, known and unknown gotaways for drug trafficking. You know, when I was chairman of this committee, went down Southern Command and talked about, uh, you know, we interdict at most 10% of the drugs. So we can talk about, yeah, we have all these fentanyl apprehensions or confiscation of fentanyl, but we're getting a mere fraction of it. In, in manufacturing, 10% is called scrap. This is completely out of control, and we need to stay it's out of control. We need to recognize reality here. I know Senator Blumenthal asked, I mean, are, do you lack resources in terms of uh, processing these claims? You know, the reason, you, yes, you lack resources because illegal immigration is completely out of control. Five million people. Chief Miller, what, 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 what problems are you having recruiting people? How many people are retiring even before they're eligible for full retirement? I go down to the border, I, I see morale at incredibly low levels. Members of the Border Patrol want to enforce our law. They're not being able to really enforce our law. They're processing. They're dispersing. It's not particularly satisfying. Can you speak to the, the level of morale now within Border Patrol? Thank you for that again, sir. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I've, uh, I've been around the country and spoken to thousands of Border Patrol agents. Uh, the pride that they have in the work that they do, um, they ask only for the tools to be able to go out and do that job. They ask for the freedom to go out and do that job as well. As I mentioned, they are processing far too much. Um, recently, we have, uh, we, uh, uh, attending a, a muster with the agents, they need better vehicles to get out to the remote areas. They need, they need border patrol. They need control over the border. They need an administration who's dedicated to controlling the border. You know, very famous movie, uh, The Sound of Freedom, talked about the sex trafficking of children. I, I've written letters to chairman of Senate committees to hold hearings on that depredation. But this open border policy is facilitating, and you know this, the multi-billion dollar business model of the human traffickers, of the sex traffickers, of the drug tra traffickers, correct? Absolutely, it's a dangerous and complex environment. And, and, and your Border Patrol agents have to, as, as Senator Langford is talking about, you know, encounter some uh, individuals in camouflage of military age, and they process and disperse them because that is what you're being directed to do by this administration. It's not your fault. This is a travesty that's happening in this country. And I think it's just, again, what's frustrating for me, having chaired this committee, held probably three dozen hearings on the border, understanding the problem, to not be holding hearings, I appreciate this hearing, but then to be speaking in such sedate terms, you know, leading people to believe, like, oh, we got this under control. Oh, yeah, only 10 years, only 10, you don't even say only. 10 years till the first hearing, immigration hearing in New York City, 10 years? 
It's a completely open border. It is out of control, and we need to call it what it is. It's an open border. This has to stop. This is not, this is not what a so sovereign country can sustain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Padilla. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Sinema and Ranking Member Langford for uh, bringing us together today to better understand how the immigration enforcement system is functioning post Title 42. And uh, I, I do want to state that I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak with witnesses from ICBP and USCIS today. But uh, I think I'm not the only member of this committee expressing a little disappointment that we don't have a chance to speak with somebody from DHS headquarters uh, to ask about some of the outstanding policy questions, um, including concerns regarding the funding allocations under CBP Shelter and Services Program, a concern that I know the chairwoman shares. I'll also note the absence of a representative from DOJ's Executive Office of Immigration Review, the Immigration Courts. Uh, without which we don't have the complete picture of how immigrants are processed at the border. Uh, while well, I applaud the work of the Biden administration to attempt to rebuild our broken immigration system, I'll continue to express uh, my serious concerns about some of the more recent policy initiatives it has undertaken, particularly that of the credible fear interviews while migrants are in CBP custody. Uh, my concern is only compounded by a lack of responsiveness to oversight requests that we have made. While I understand that the focus of today's hearing is large on operations and implementation, I do want to note for the record the, uh, this concerning lack of responsiveness, and I want to reiterate my expectation that DHS provide all the requested information and answer outstanding questions in a timely manner. I believe I speak for uh, all members of the committee. Uh, in that regard, particularly as we're being asked to consider additional border funding in the supplemental uh, in the very near future. But as far as questions for today, let me begin by noting CBP and DHS's proactive engagement in operational planning with NGOs that provide shelter and services to migrants and asylum seekers in Southern California. I think this type of coordination is vital to ensure that NGOs can efficiently and safely provide services for migrant families and adults who are released by CBP to continue with their immigration cases. And I actually think this uh, model of coordination and cooperation should be considered a best practice and an expectation moving forward. However, I do continue to hear that coordination and information sharing practices between CBP and NGOs could still be improved somewhat, particularly in terms of sharing demographic information and linguistic needs information of individuals being transferred to NGOs. So uh, Mr. Davies, uh, can you please explain how CBP coordinates with NGOs and local jurisdictions on individuals released from custody? Yeah, thank, thank you for the question, Senator. So we do uh, engage with local NGOs. I, I think you're right that we have a very good relationship in Southern California. Uh, I, I wish that the, the level of engagement from some of our other locations would, would be as, as good and robust. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of, I don't want to say stuck with the hand, but we're dealt sometimes in terms of the, the partners that we have to rely on because uh, from, a, from an OFO perspective, when we are done processing, it is our intention to move uh, individuals out of the ports of entry so as not to create a safety or security issue at the port of entry. Um, so we do, we do coordinate with them. We, we uh, do not always uh, have the ability to share individual information on the, the non-citizens who are coming through and being moved forward to the uh, NGOs. Uh, some of that is from a, a privacy perspective, as, as I understand it. Uh, but I think your point about sharing demographic uh, and, and linguistic, we know that those are challenges for us that we face when we, we talk about having translators available uh, for so, some of the nationalities that we process. Um, and, and I think that you know, I, I can understand why that's important for the NGOs to have as yeah, well. And, and that's why I specified those two examples, because that's not personal identifiable information. Uh, that just seems to me, unless there's a legal restriction that suggests otherwise, helpful information for the NGOs trying to you know, assist here uh, and play that supportive role for you all. Now, you use the terms, you know, working with the hand that were dealt. 
Uh, is it a policy restriction? Is it a quality of NGO uh, challenge? Why can't this model of cooperation be expanded and replicated in other areas? Yeah, I, I, thank you again. I, I do think that some of it um, has to do with capacity of the NGOs. We have, we have attempted at, at all of our locations across the, uh, across the Southwest border to engage with our NGO partners, and we understand that they're under you know, uh, a, a large strain too because of the volume coming across. Um, and that's what we see is that, that their capacity is, is strained usually far before CBP's capacity is, is strained. And so that creates those logistical challenges for them and for us. I understand, and look, getting you on the record here is helpful because we've tried to advocate for additional funding for them from the federal government because at the end what they're doing is playing a supportive role to your function uh, in a much more cost-effective way than if we you know, try to do all this with federal employees uh, from one agency or department or another. Uh, and, and just to be specific here, I know my time is, is running, uh, the impact of shelter providers on CBP's ability to process individuals, can you just take 30 seconds on that? The, the, the NGOs that are receiving uh, some of these folks. Yeah, if-, if Their if, capacity if, to shelter. If is they're not able to receive, if they don't have capacity at their shelters, then it, it means that ultimately the individuals that we're releasing from the ports of entry may not have somewhere to go. They may not have a bus to get onto. They may not have transportation or services available, um, which, which creates a strain on the local border communities in proximity to the ports of entry. Great. Thank you. Uh, the other uh, area I wanted to make sure to raise is um, in the area of criminal prosecution of asylum seekers. As we all know, under our existing immigration laws, people do have a right uh, to seek asylum in our country, irrespective of their manner of entry. Doesn't mean it's guaranteed, but they can at least seek it. Put simply, someone who crosses the border in the desert and turns themselves into border patrol to seek asylum has just as much of a right to do so as someone who walks up to a port of entry to present themselves to claim fear. I know we're working on incentives to do it at a port of entry and not in between. Uh, but at the same time, the administ this administration has been clear that it intends to impose consequences for unlawful entry, including potential prosecutions for unlawful entry and re-entry. I've been trying for a while now to get a clear answer on where the administration stands on referring migrants for prosecution who have claimed fear. I'll address this question to Mr. B. Miller. What is the Border Patrol's policy regarding referral of asylum seekers for prosecution under uh, USC 1325 or 1326? So I'd, I'd like to actually reverse that just a, a bit, Senator. Um, so anybody can claim asylum, even if they're being prosecuted. Uh, I think that's an important note to, to make, that regardless whether they are being pursued for a criminal charge, they still have the right and retain the right to uh, claim asylum. Okay, and, but, but walk me through that process, uh, and among the clarity that I'm seeking is, is the referral for prosecution before or after CBP determines whether someone is an asylum seeker, or both? The determination is made at the time of uh, interview when they make the claim, so that, that is determined. And, and the criteria time. for referral? The same as any other asylum claim. Which is? Uh, fear of returning to their country, fear of um, being injured. No, the referral for, pro for prosecution. What's the criteria to refer somebody for prosecution? Uh, being, uh, well, the crime that they committed, whether they have a past uh, criminal record that they're being reinstated for, it, it just depends on, on the circumstances. There's, there's, if you're trying to get at uh, our are individuals targeted for claiming asylum? Uh, that's absolutely not not accurate. Now, just wondering what uh, again, what what uh, guidance uh, field agents have for making that determination, referring for prosecution or not? So, in certain locations, uh, for targeted efforts, depending on the, the circumstances, um, to try to again apply, as you mentioned, uh, a, a, a consequence to a location that is being exploited by the uh, transnational criminal organizations and alien smugglers, um, they, uh, we may apply a targeted 
uh, prosecution effort in a specific location um, in order to try to minimize that, uh, the risk to the migrants crossing through that area and try to uh, push back the, uh, the TCOs taking advantage of the vulnerable populations crossing in a specific area. area. Now, um, you know, one, one additional, additional thing, and again, get to back to the beginning of it, is regardless of that, when we take them into custody, they still have the same right as anybody else to claim asylum. Okay, we'll have some follow-up questions after. Thank you very much, thank you both. Thank you, Senator Padilla. We'll now start our second round of questions. Um, I'll grant myself time for questions. Um, I'm gonna pick up where I left off. Uh, my next question is for the entire panel. As we've heard, um, this is an extremely complex process, and a small breakdown can have large effects on the overall operation. Where do bottlenecks typically occur in the process for each of your organizations? We'll start with Mr. Davies and then move across the panel. Uh, th thank you. I, I think for OFO at the ports of entry, the, the biggest bottleneck uh, that we encounter is uh, when it comes to release. And so that's whether the uh, individual is uh, being referred for uh, detention with ERO or being released, as was just mentioned, with the NGOs making sure that there's a, a, a smooth transition and minimal amount of time once we've completed case processing to move those individuals out of our port of entry is, is imperative for us. That's, that's the biggest bottleneck. So as far as uh, Border Patrol is concerned, uh, there's, there's a, a number of bottlenecks that occur throughout the, uh, the entire immigration enforcement continuum, uh, starting with at, en at encounter. Um, and uh, when large groups uh, enter, uh, four or 500, sometimes even 1,000, it can create a significant um, drain on our resources and our personnel to extract those individuals out of the field. So that, that's probably the first. Um, and to the back end of that, our, um, our turning over to other agencies, uh, also post-processing, um, uh, waiting for available space, waiting for available um, uh, acceptance is, is uh, probably our biggest bottlenecks. Um, thank you for the question. For ERO, um, our bit biggest bottleneck is obtaining travel documents and actually affecting the removal um, um, for countries other than Northern Tri Triangle countries. For USCIS, I think one of our biggest bottlenecks is that this expedited removal process remains a very paper-based process, and each of the three components have their own ways of, um, their own parts of the credible fear process. We've made great strides in being able to um, digitize parts of that process and make an electronic environment end-to-end. -end. I think we've overcome a lot of those bottlenecks um, to that end, and that's a major and a significant accomplishment. Thank you. Um, Chief B. Miller, I'd like to continue with the discussion on credible fear interviews in Border Patrol custody. How many sectors are currently participating in the program, and if there are plans to expand that to other sectors, how does the policy affect operations in the sectors that do currently conduct those interviews? Thank you. We have, um, we have five sectors that are currently um, uh, conducting immigration, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, are conducting uh, credible fear interviews, um, and uh, we have uh, we have tried uh, to sample those in Del Rio as well. Um, I, I would I would say that um, there there is a significant um, backlog in the time of custody and our tick times, raising the the overall tick times for for Border Patrol in custody. Um, an average for a, uh, it averages between nine and 16 days um, in custody to completely um, process them all the way through uh, the CFI process while in Border Patrol custody. Thank you, Mr. Davies. Now that OFO has increased the number of CBP-1 appointments at ports across the southwest border, it can take even longer for migrants to get a walk-in appointment. Of course, that can counterproductively incentivize migrants to ca cross between ports. So what's the current total number of daily CBP-1 appointments across the southwest border, and how many walk-in appointments are you able to accommodate each day? So across the, the eight ports of entry where we're processing CBP-1 appointments, we uh, intake on, on a, or schedule on a daily basis 1,450 appointments. 
uh, in addition to those, both at those same eight locations and at the other locations that do not accept CBP-1 appointments, uh, we generally, on average, take about 200 uh, other individuals in a day. And that will, the way that that happens will vary from port to port. In some cases, when they have uh, completed all of their appointments for the day, they'll, they'll bring uh, others in from the line. In some, in some places, it will be throughout the day as capacity allows, they'll, they'll uh, bring in individuals who do not have appointments. Thank you, and Mr. Davies, most migrants that are being processed at ports of entry are making appointments through this app, but there are issues with the app. There are a limited number of languages, which makes it difficult for some groups to access the scheduling system. So when processing walk-in appointments, does OFO ask migrants why they didn't or weren't able to make a CBP-1 appointment? And if so, what are the responses that you most commonly are hearing? So we don't, in a systematic way, re require our officers to ask that information or record it in our system of record. We do know anecdotally, because some of our officers do ask that question, um, that, that typically the answers we get back are that they either didn't have access to the phone, they, they, they may say that they weren't aware of the process, or as you pointed out, they will say that there were issues with the language availability in, in the app itself. So we're aware of some of those shortcomings. We're to the ones that we have the ability to, to address. We're working to address with constant updates to the app. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davidson, from an operational perspective, how has the circumvention of lawful pathways rule affected USCIS's work with migrants apprehended at the southwest border? And has it had any significant reduction in the number of credible fear interviews that the agency is conducting? Thank you, Senator. Um, it's not have had a reduction. It's had an increase in the amount of interviews that have been referred to USCIS um, since um, um, May 12th. And certainly the, the process to analyze a credible fear case under the CLP, there's more complexities involved having to analyze exceptions and then the presumption rebuttal. And so that part has um, you know, added more time to the credible fear process, certainly. Uh, my last question is for the panel. With the end of the fiscal year rapidly approaching, we're hearing more conversations about what happens if Congress can't complete its work of keeping the government funded. How would a government shutdown affect each of your components' abilities to make sure that the management border systems are functioning? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Davies and move across the panel. Thank you. I, I think the biggest impact that the, a government shutdown would have on, on the Office of Field Operations would be uh, the morale of our workforce because, as we know, through previous government shutdowns, uh, we would continue coming to work and, and securing our border at our ports of entry. Um, but for officers, especially over a prolonged period of time, not having a paycheck to go home to uh, is uh, extremely demoralizing and debilitating uh, for, for our officers that uh, many of them may live paycheck to paycheck and in places where there are high costs of living. Uh, and so uh, that, to me, would be the biggest concern. You know, we, we had during the last government shutdown uh, to go through this process of allowing many of our officers to seek outside employment. I think that's a, a dangerous precedent to set having officers working a, a second job somewhere else just to try to make money. Well, uh, they should be focused on our primary law enforcement missions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now recognize Senator Langford for um, continued questions. Thank you. I want to walk through um, process, uh, what we've talked about a little bit before, trying to just be able to get a handle on it because the complexities are definitely there. And what we've tried to pursue is how are the decisions made and what are the documents that DHS has provided to each entity on what the criteria is to be able to make a decision on this. So I'm just going to kind of run through this briefly here. So they CBP-1 app, they say they fill out the app there, they enter the port, uh, they're screened for parole or an asylum claim, and we're trying to figure out some of that process uh, on the screening for parole and the asylum claim. Then they find out they're screened for parole, they're vetting, they get an appointment, uh, they could be turned around, they could be put, uh, paroled into the United States, then eligible for work authorization. We understand that if they come through the CBP-1 app, they get parole, they could get the work authorization within one month. Let me start there on the initial one. Somebody that came in through the, uh, through the port of entry, filled out the CBP-1 app, is it most common for that individual to get parole at that point? 
So just, just to clarify, uh, approximately 90% of the individuals who show up with a CBP-1 appointment are given a case processing disposition of NTA. They are served a notice to appear before an immigration judge, but ultimately as a, as a custody disposition, they are paroled out of custody. Okay. So yes. So they're paroled out of custody, about 90% you're saying on that. Best we can tell are those individuals also seeking an asylum claim, because my understanding is they've got a one-year time period to also seek an asylum claim, or are they just in parole? So they're, they're, uh, if they applied with CBP-1, they're generally given a two-year parole at the port of entry as, as a custody determination while they're in removal proceedings. And you're correct, they do have the ability to pursue asylum uh, while they're in the pendency of those removal proceedings, but they're, we're not accepting their claim per se at the port of entry as part so of the So where would they make that asylum claim? Because the clock is ticking for them to be able to make the asylum claim. How would they do that? So I, I would defer to my colleague from USCIS, but they, there is an ability for them to make that claim eventually in front of the immigration judge if they don't do uh, anything with USCIS. Davis. If they're in defense of asylum proceedings under Section 240, they would make their claim with the immigration judge. If they were in the affirmative asylum process with USCIS, then they would make that claim with USCIS. Depends on the pathway. But if they're under immigration proceedings, they would certainly make it with the courts. So they've got a two-year parole that they're given. 90% of the folks that fill out the CBP-1 app at that point get a two-year parole. Uh, at what point are they having a decision made on their parole and what happens next? Or are they transitioning to other visas? Are they transitioning to other status? What's happening next? We've had this process in place for about four months now. We're just trying to be able to figure out how it's operating. I can state if they were in parole status, that they were paroled in but not in immigration proceedings, then they would have the ability to file for asylum with USCIS. Okay. What happens to them? They're in parole they've been given documentation at the border that they're in a parole proceeding, what, what's happening? So, so again, just to clarify, the, the parole document at that point is to document the, the custody determination that they, they, they've been released. Their, their actual status is that they're in removal proceedings. So until there's an outcome with respect to the removal proceedings before EOIR, they're, they're, the fact that their parole has run out, um, at least from an OFO perspective, is, is largely irrelevant because their status in the United States is still that uh, they're pending removal proceedings. But those removal proceeding hearing would be when? They could be several years down the road. It's determined by the courts, EOIR sets the calendar for the removal, for, for the removal hearing. So we have an individual that has a two-year parole but it could be six years before they actually get a hearing. Those last four years, what's their status, other than they're in removal? Does anybody know? I don't say this is helpful for us because we're asking the same questions, just trying to be able to figure out what the status is for this individual. It's our understanding as well that if they do the CBP-1 app, regardless of where they're from, anywhere in the world, about 90% are actually being paroled. Our understanding is within a month that they're getting a work authorization. Is that correct or not correct? They're eligible for work authorization immediately after they're paroled into the United States. So it wouldn't necessarily take a month at that point, it could be days. I mean, we aspire to have them complete certainly in 30 days. And so we're working you know, steadfast to make sure that happens. It would, it would just require us to be able to analyze that application that's been filed and issue them the, the employment authorization document. Okay, so let me, let me ask this question as well. So if, if they come to the port without going through the app, they just arrive at the port and say, hey, didn't understand the language, or I just got in line, or I didn't know, but they're at the port, they didn't do the app at all. What's different about their process? So largely the process is, is very similar. They're, they have to wait until there's capacity, right? We don't turn- Right, maybe a couple on, of days, right? right? So once they come in, the, the, the numbers for us look um, a, a bit different too in that only roughly about half of the people who come in without an appointment are actually given an NTA and paroled as a result. So what's the difference there? Why? Uh, well, we, we didn't have their information and, and sometimes it's about the, the, the individual circumstances that they have. Uh, presenting, there may be a reason why they didn't want to submit the CBP-1 app, but as a result of the the case-by-case -case determination, the officers have determined that, that they may be still put in removal proceedings, but they may be referred for detention. How many of those are actually turned around and told, hey, go fill out the app and come back another day? Is that happening? 
I, I don't think that that's a significant portion of the individuals that we're processing without appointments, no. Okay, so of the half that are turned around, they're turned around and said, hey, you're, you're not eligible to be able to come through at all, and they're literally turned around and head back to Mexico, correct? That could be a, a, a subpopulation, yes. Okay, and then the other half that are accepted through, they would go through the same process. They'd get a work authorization immediately within 30 days or less. They would be set up for parole for two years, though it could be years before they get their actual hearing, correct? So if, but our, our policy states that if someone uh, without a CBP-1 appointment is processed for removal proceedings, rather than uh, having a two-year parole issued, their parole is issued for a period of only one year. Right, but they're still awaiting, they're still gonna have a gap, because even the person who's given two years may have several years of gap between when their parole expires and when their actual hearing occurs. There's just a bigger gap. Is there a consequence? Is ICE pursuing any of these individuals that their parole has expired, for instance? Once the individual um, shows up at an immigration office, they should have um, reporting requirements. So they could be placed on alternative detention or just monitored on the non-detained docket at that point on an order of recognizance. But that would be starting in the first, first days that they're there. That wouldn't be something later, a year down the road, to go pursue those individuals and then put them on alternative detention. It, the, the, change in, the change in their, their position could be at any point when they're checking into our offices. Okay. Where does the rebuttable presumption kick in on this? If they have not filled out the CBP-1 app, they arrive at a port of entry, is there a rebuttable presumption? Where does that apply or is that applied? It applies during the, the asylum interview itself, the credible fear interview. Okay, but that would only be if they actually request asylum at that point for 50%. They're getting parole, they're not necessarily requesting asylum or they could request it later at their hearing. The rebuttal presumption would um, affect those who will um, file for or make a credible fear of claim, correct? Yes, sir. So, but that would be possible, I'm just gonna say three years from now when they actually have their hearing, let's say, the rebuttable presumption would apply then. No, no, Senator, the rebuttal presumption is, is analyzed during the credible fear process itself. Um, once CBP or ICE refers the case for the, for the credible fear screening along with analyzing the exceptions to the... To the to but I'm, I'm taking this case, they arrive at a port of entry, they did not fill out the CBB-1 app, they're in that 50% that was given parole, they didn't ask for asylum at that point, they're released in the country, there is no, they're just awaiting their hearing at that point, there is no challenge. They may challenge for asylum at their hearing then, and they're gonna bring it up then, would a rebuttable presumption then apply at that point? That's, that's correct. I mean, the, the rebuttal presumption would not apply before the immigration court. The immigration judges would be analyzing their asylum claim um, and then withholding it of a removal and then cap during that claim. Okay, let me, let me keep going on this because I don't want to run us out of time. They're coming between the ports of entry. They, they're out in the open desert area. They actually enter at that point. Border Patrol is able to encounter them, take them to one of the stations, begin the processing. They process them, then do the fingerprint, do the every, medical checks, everything else that they've got to be able to do. What happens to that individual then at that point? So very similar. Again, they'd be referred to uh, USCIS once, once processed, and um, if uh, space is available, they might be turned over to uh, ERO. Okay, that is if they request asylum, the USCIS would, would engage? Is that correct? Or are they basically all of them requesting asylum? USCIS would engage on every case of a, an asylum claim. Okay, but are all of them requesting asylum that you're encountering between the ports of entry? No. Okay, of those that are not requesting asylum, what's their disposition? Uh, they're either withdrawn or, um, uh, they're either withdrawn or provided, some of them are prosecuted, just, just depends on um, the circumstances. When you say withdrawn, help me understand what that means. Uh, so they would uh, uh, actually uh, be processed to return back to Mexico uh, from the country that they came, so voluntary departure. So a voluntary departure at that point. Our understanding is, and this is something Senator Sinema and I have tried to track for a while, and it's expedited removal. Expedited removal sounds like you're actually moved quick, removed quickly. Our understanding is expedited removal doesn't actually mean you're removed quickly. What's the current expedited removal percentage of people that are actually removed from the country? Does anyone know? I don't have that information. I understanding it's a pretty small number. 
actually, of those that are declared expedited removal that are actually removed from the country. We've been trying to get that data, and every number that we've had has been a pretty low percentage. The vast majority of people under expedited removal are actually still currently in the country, and have some have been for years uh, still in the country under quote-unquote expedited removal, uh, but they're not actually removed. Uh, so if, if that person requests asylum between ports of entry, they've been processed in the Border Patrol Station, soft-sided, hard-sided facility, or whatever it may be, they requested asylum, USCIS then does the interview at that point, is that correct? And you're doing that in the stations now? We do those interviews virtually, Senator, okay. um, with the assistance of our colleagues at CBP, um, but you're correct, it would be done in those five locations. If those individuals are deemed to have credible fear at that point, then what happens to them? If they're deemed to have credible fear, then they are issued a notice to appear and put under section 240 um, full removal proceedings. Okay. So they appear before the immigration court. And they would, the, that's the notice to appear. Uh, then they're released in the country. They've got a notice to appear. Uh, that's with ICE, right, at some location. And then a setting, then a date is then set after that for a court hearing. Right or not right on that? Um, ICE, ICE would assess, you know, the releasability of that information. But that's correct, Senator. Then they would have a date set by the courts for them to appear before their hearing. After, after they've gotten the the check-in with ICE at that point for the notice to appear. Is that correct or not correct? I'm trying to be able to track just dates and what happens here. That I defer to the device on. Yeah, um, typically when a notice of, uh, our notice to appear is issued, it's, um, we go into ECAS and get a court date and a, and a time for those individuals if they're leaving custody. So how long is that typically before they would get that hearing? Currently, where are we on a notice to appear? The hearings could take years, sir, okay. with the OIR. So, uh, question on that, when, when do they get a work authorization? They've been, they've requested an asylum request. They came between ports of entry, requested asylum, been given a notice to appear, released into the country. When can they get a work authorization? I mean, they're, they're eligible for a work authorization um, under, if they file the defense of asylum claim and they're before the courts, then they're eligible for a work authorization. How quickly? So, um, as quickly as they file the application and we can process it. So um, certainly we're averaging around less than 60 days for defense of asylum employment authorization documents. Okay. So, so what I'm trying to figure out is if somebody fills out the CBB1 app, goes through that process, comes to the port of entry, they're processed through into the country, and within 30 days, they're going to have a work authorization, or they can come between ports of entry, request asylum, and within 60 days, they'll have a work authorization. And either one of them, it'll be years before they actually have a hearing. A correct or not correct on that? In the, in the non-detained setting? The, yes, that's sir. correct. Yes, sir. Your non-detainment docket at this point, if I'm remembering correctly, USCIS has about a 40,000 person backlog in just the interview process for the non-detained docket. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. My understanding is as well, there's another group of folks in the non-detained docket that are not in that 40,000 number that is an unknown number because their paperwork hasn't been processed yet to be able to get into that backlog of 40,000. I think at this point we're re relatively caught up in terms of processing, you know, cases into the system, and so I think those numbers are pretty static. The forty thousand. So the forty thousand is the number at this yeah. point. How long will it take to be able to do the interviews? Because those are individuals that typically I would assume came between ports of injury at some point. It was as Mr. Miller talked about before, many times when there's a you know five hundred people came at once. There's not space to be able to actually hold these folks. They were released out. There wasn't an opportunity to be able to do the interviews at that point. So we've got 40,000-ish people in that group. How long will it take to be able to identify, find them, and be able to do those interviews? Well, we know where they're at because we coordinate that with our colleagues at ICE. And so and we coordinate the interviews with our colleagues at ICE, too, in the non, for the non-detained docket. That's a matter of resources, of us being able to divert resources that are also interviewing credible fear claims on the border to be able to address the non-detained workload along with our affirmative asylum work. So we prioritize that work along with our credible fear work, which has certainly increased. 
So it's a matter of priority, prioritization when we get to those cases. So give me a guess, how long will that take? I can't give you a, uh, an answer on that, Senator. I would have to get back to you on an average um, time to process our non-detained docket. Okay, great, I, I would make a request just from our committee as well that any guidance documents that you've received on how to make decisions on who to parole, what that decision is for these 90% of folks at some point that are paroled in, the 10% that are not paroled, there has to be some document that's a guidance to be able to make that decision and to be able to know. We've asked for those documents over and over again. How are those decisions made? And most often we get an answer back from DHS that says, you know, the officer on the field will make the decision. I would say I, I know our structure in the federal government enough. There is some guidance there. It's not just what did the officer have for breakfast that morning and are they feeling it today? There is some guidance, but we've received nothing uh, as far as guidance and information on how decisions are made. So that'd be really helpful to us to be able to see that process. The same thing for USCIS as you're going through that process. It'd be helpful for us to be able to see how those decisions are actually made and what the criteria is for making a decision. I really appreciate all four of you being here, the time that you put into preparing for this. We, we've had just the opportunity to be able to scratch the surface, but this is something we've asked for for a long time. Just tell us how decisions are made and what the process is, because this is a very, very new process, and we're seeing record numbers of people. The numbers dropped off dramatically right after Title 42 changed, and then they accelerated again uh, to numbers, as Washington Post listed, that literally our country has never seen the numbers that were coming in for family units in August. And so we've seen the skyrocket. We're trying to understand how decisions are being made and what that looks like on the ground. So thanks again for your service, and we'll follow up. Uh, thank you, Senator Langford. Um, I, I neglected to have the other three members of the panel answer my question around the government shutdown. So before we conclude today, I'd like to just pick up where we left off. Thank you, Mr. Davies, for your answer. Um, Chief B. Miller, if you could answer, and then Mr. Bible and Mr. Davidson. Uh, and to refresh you on the question, how would a government shutdown affect each of your components' abilities to make sure that the border management system continues to function? Yeah, thank you for, again for the question. Um, I, I would have to echo almost everything that uh, XD Davies uh, mentioned. Uh, morale certainly is a problem, and we've faced this for uh, many, many years over and over again. So the, there is a wariness with the workforce. Um, our operators are uh, committed to the mission, and they will, uh, you know, report to duty. Um, I, I would say one of the biggest, um, aside from the morale and the the, uh, the unknown um, of when the next paycheck is coming, uh, our partnerships um, are affected. Uh, both uh, state, uh, I'm sorry, both uh, anybody that has you know federal contracts and. Um, th those are all uh, points of concern for us. And when we're already stretched thin and we're at risk of uh, compromised contracts and other things, uh, it's, it's definitely an issue for us. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I, I too would like to echo both of their statements, but to add, add one more part to that. Um, um, one of the our loss of our support staff during that time, they're, they're instrumental in us processing individuals through the immigration pathways and doing our job. And typically those folks are not reporting to work if the government shuts down, which will um, impact us greatly. Thank you. Recognizing that USCIS is a fee-funded agency, 96% of our agency is funded by fee funds. I mean, it still has an impact for a senator because our E-Verify program is appropriated, but also it's the, still, it's the still same consensus from my colleagues. It has a morale issue on our staff of being able to experience a government shutdown or having to experience that, it's the same, same factor. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, with that, uh, we've reached the conclusion of today's hearing. I appreciate each of our witnesses for your time and for your testimony, and I want to thank all my colleagues on the panel for their participation. This was a very important and a timely hearing. I know there were a lot of questions we didn't have an opportunity to ask, so I'll submit questions for the record so we can continue to examine this critical need, and I know my colleagues will as well. The hearing record will remain open for 15 days until 5 o'clock p.m. on Thursday, September the 21st for the submission of statements and questions for the record. And with that, our hearing is adjourned.